Shalom. Welcome everyone uh, to class. Thank you all for joining um, the class on our study for on the book of Titus this uh, morning. Um, we'll, we uh, looked at the introduction to the book of Titus um, uh, last class, last Friday. Uh, now we begin studying uh, chapter one. Before we study chapter one, can one of you please lead us in prayer, please? Anyone can lead us in prayer? Shall we pray? My dear Father, I want to say thank you this morning for the gift of life. Thank you, all of everyone. Thank you for our pastor. Thank you for the end coming on this section of this lecture. Father, we give you all the glory. Thank you for the beginning and thank you for where we are. Father, we commit our lecture into your hands today. Father, may we be doers of your word and give us strength and increase the wisdom and knowledge of our pastor in the name of Jesus. Thank you, my Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Not able to hear uh, all of you. I think I need to disconnect and then reconnect again. So I don't know if I should do that or just continue with our class and then maybe uh, do that in the second hour. Okay, so if you have any questions, any doubts, you can um, uh, post it in the chat section or if you want to say something, you can say it and then maybe Jeffina can just uh, repeat it out for me because she's just sitting in front of me. Okay, uh, we'll begin uh, with chapter one. Can uh, one of you uh, please read verses one to four, please? Titus chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. Anyone like to read? Titus uh, chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. Paul, a born servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth, which are caught with godliness in the hope of eternal life, with which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began, but has in due time manifested his word through preaching, which was committed to me according to the commandment of God our Savior, to Titus, a true son in our common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God, the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Uh, thank you, uh, Jeffina. Okay, so we'll begin with verse, you all can hear me clearly, right? Is there, uh, okay, yeah, thank you. Okay, so Paul, a born servant of God, an apostle of Christ Jesus. So Paul is basically following the uh, the letter writing customs of his time by writing, you know, uh, putting his name first, basically saying who's writing this letter. And then, uh, you know, he uh, goes on to give his greetings. And um, in this um, letter to, um, you know, uh, to Titus, uh, it is basically written to uh, the Christians uh, on the island of Crete as well, even though it is specifically addressing uh, Titus, but also, you know, this Paul knew that this letter would be read publicly uh, among the churches on the island of Crete. So in the opening uh, part of his letter, in the introduction itself, you know, Paul is taking great care uh, to tell the believers or to tell the churches at Crete what his credentials are and where he stood on important issues. Okay, so that is why he says, Paul, a born servant of Christ Jesus, an apostle, a born servant of God, an apostle of Christ Jesus, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth, uh, which, uh, which accords to uh, godliness. So uh, the word he uses here, born servant of God, you know, when Paul 
chose to call himself as a bond servant of God, uh, he's basically uh, used, choosing to use this ancient Greek word called doulos. Uh, and this word doulos basically means a slave. And it's a word that is only designated to a low slave, somebody who's a very low slave. Okay. Um, and it's also, he's saying that he's a bond servant, which means he's made himself a slave by choice. So we know that, um, you know, uh, uh, God makes this provision for slaves in the Old Testament that, you know, um, on the seventh year, they they are set free to go. But if a slave loves their master very much and their master has been very nice to them, kind to them, you know, then the slave can choose to work the rest of his life for his master. And then, you know, they uh, they basically pour a, pour a, uh, 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 a hole in his ears just to show that he's a bond a servant for um, life. So here we see that Paul is saying that I'm not only a slave, but also a born slave by choice. I've made myself a slave uh, uh, because he's saying that I'm someone who's completely surrendered myself to the will, uh, to the authority of another. And so Paul chooses to be a slave who has surrendered his will and authority to uh, God. Okay, um, so he's Paul is saying that though I have chosen to be a bond servant, yet you know he's saying that he has a high place because uh, he's a bond servant of God, and it's never you know a low thing uh, to be a servant of God. Uh, or it's never a low thing to serve or be a servant of this great and mighty um, God. And then he says he's also an apostle of Christ Jesus. I'm not going to explain this uh, phrase, apostle of Christ Jesus, because I've explained this when we studied uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1 and 2 Timothy chapter 1 as um, well. Okay, so uh, we'll move on. According to the faith of God's elect, and the acknowledgement of the truth which accords with godliness. Now, if you look at the Passion Translation, the Passion Translation renders this verse as, I'm writing you to further the faith of God's chosen ones and lead them to the full knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. So this gives us a better understanding. So basically, Paul is mentioning here his mission. And his mission is to further the faith of God's chosen ones and the knowledge of the truth that is in keeping with godliness. That is what this phrase, according to the faith of God's elect and the knowledge of truth, which accords to godliness, means. Okay, And then he says, according to the faith of God's elect, so God's elect are those whom God foreknew even before the foundations of the world uh, who would choose him and receive his salvation. And those who receive salvation do so by, you know, exercising their personal faith, uh, which is prompted or empowered by the Holy um, Spirit. Okay, so we can... Uh, all identify with God's elect because we have responded to the gospel of Jesus Christ or we've responded to uh, salvation um, um, and we are living our lives after that gospel. Okay, And then he says, uh, according to faith of God's elect uh, 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 and the acknowledgement of the truth which accords with godliness. So what does this phrase with accords with godliness mean okay uh, the aim of god's truth is to promote what what does it aim to promote what does scripture aim to promote in us god's laws commandments what does it aim to promote in us it says here in this verse it aims to promote Godliness, right? Because it says with 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 accords with godliness. Okay, so the aim of God's truth is to promote godliness in God's people. So Paul's ministry and mission 
as an apostle was to preach and teach the gospel to the body of Christ uh, and to establish the churches in sound doctrine, in sound faith, in the knowledge of the truth. Okay, so this was Paul's mission and focus, and this should also be the mission and the purpose of the church today. This should also be our mission and our purpose uh, for ourselves today, because our need should be to promote the development and the growth of mature faith in God's chosen ones, which is his believers. Um, and this is when we, um, you know, teach them uh, the truth in his word. Okay. Uh, verse 2, Paul says, In hope of eternal life, which God who cannot lie promised before time began. So basically, Paul is stating that his ministry and apostleship in the interest of the faith of God's chosen ones and their knowledge of the truth uh, that also promotes godliness rests on the hope of eternal life. Okay, so everything that we are doing to build uh, people in the truth, in the knowledge of the truth, you know, is to promote godliness and this rests on the hope of eternal life. In hope, the word hope here is not just wishing for something or just hoping that something will come true. Hope, basically, the Greek word for hope means, you know, confident expectation and anticipation. So it's a confident expectation and anticipation. Uh, uh, and why are we having this confident expectation because it rests on the promise of a God who not only uh, does he not lie but cannot because of his perfect and holy character okay so that is our confident expectation because it rests on the promise of a God who not only cannot lie but also because he is holy he is perfect in every aspect in every area of his life. Um, and the word eternal life uh, means, you know, the Zoe life, the God kind of life also. And it's not something that believers will possess only, you know, um, on, uh, on the day that we die and see God face to face, when we will live eternally with him. But it's also something that we realize now and we, ex uh, we can live now and experience now. Uh, and this uh, reality of this eternal life uh, can become uh, a present tense reality in us when we are born again. And that is what John chapter 3 verse 36 promises us, that the one who believes in the Son has eternal life. That means... Uh, has possessed eternal life, has received eternal life. So eternal life is something that we experience here and, and now in the present, even though it's a, a eschatological hope, but it's also a realized eschatology. That means we can realize and live that hope um, of eternal life here and now in the present. Okay, And then he says, which, which God who cannot lie, Okay. So there are two points the Apostle makes here, uh, the reality or the truth of God and the eternal nature of his promises. Okay, That God cannot lie means God is free from falsehood or it's used um, as uh, not guilty of falsehood or, you know, he is always truthful. Okay. So the literal meaning here is God who is free from all deceit or falsehood. So when we're saying that God cannot lie, it's basically meaning that he is free from all deceit or falsehood and uh, also that he is truthful and trustworthy. Okay. So how wonderful that our eternal life rests on the truth of a God who simply cannot lie, who is completely truthful and honest. Okay. And he says that uh, this is something that he has promised even before time began. So Paul goes 
uh, to show or tell us that this eternal life that is promised was not a, you know, a momentary decision or some point in history or time when God made this decision uh, that came into his mind or it did not come into his mind after man sinned and, uh, you know, uh, uh, sin uh, took control over him, uh, 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 like we read in Genesis chapter 3. But this promise stretches back to eternity past, even before the foundations of the uh, world. Okay. Verse 3, but has in due time manifested his word through preaching, which was committed to me according to the commandment of God our Savior. Okay. So what does Paul mean by saying, but has in due time manifested his word? Anyone like to throw some light on this? What does Paul mean when he says, but has in due time manifested his word? I think it actually means that uh, there was a promise in Genesis chapter 3 that the Christ was going to come and uh, I can't hear you. Yes, uh, please go ahead, Lubega. What were you saying about uh, the meaning of uh, what Paul is saying in due times manifested his word? I was saying that. Uh, we know very well that uh, when they talk about the word, there are three or two parts to this sentence, according to my simple analysis. One would be in, in Genesis chapter 3, God promised that the Christ would come and we call him. When you read in Gem John 1, 1, it means the, the word was the Christ. And again, it was in due time that God decided to, 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 to give Paul a chance to be a, a, a co-worker in the in his kingdom so when you we all know that paul was the judaizer before i mean was the jew was the sadistic or a pharisee was the pharisee but on the road to damascus god appointed him and took him in arabia and trained him so that he can also be preaching the word of god so i think this is the line in which we think he is meaning thank you Yes, thank you, Lubega. Anyone else? What is Paul basically meaning when he says, but has in due time manifested his word? I'll just share my thoughts. Uh, and maybe uh, Jesus being manifested uh, in the human format. Uh, he was the word. Maybe that's what he's talking about. But he also says through preaching, uh, which could be like us preaching about Jesus. I'm just sharing whatever it comes in my way. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So if you need to look at any verse and understand it, we need to understand it in the context and also what this uh, comes before it or after it. So here, you know, in, in verse 2, he's saying the hope of eternal life, which God who cannot lie promised before time began. So Eternal life was something that was planned and completed thing in the heart and mind of God even before the foundations of this world. So when Paul is writing and continue to talk about this in verse 3, he's saying, but as in due time manifested his word, he's saying that while salvation was or eternal life was, you know, something that God purposed and was settled in his heart in eternity past. Uh, you know, with the Lamb being slain even before the foundations of the world, Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, even before Christ came to the earth and he died on the cross, even before that, you know, um, uh, the Lamb had already been slain. You know, it was already the work of salvation, the work of redemption was already a completed, done thing in the heart and mind of uh, God, even before it took place in history. Uh, so Paul is saying, you know, it was a completed thing in the heart and mind of God. Yes, it happened at one point in time. And the proclamation of this, that message was made known uh, in God's own time, according to his own purpose. That's when Jesus came, the fullness of time, the Kairos moment. So in the Old Testament, there was an anticipation of this salvation message through the prophets and through uh, the tabernacle, the priesthood, the sacrifices, everything that God had instituted, everything pointed out 
to the Messiah, uh, which spoke about Christ, uh, the work he's going to do, the work he's going to fulfill, the work he's going to complete, everything was pointing out to uh, uh, to Jesus, uh, the Messiah would come. So everything that God instituted on in the Old Testament was actually pointing out to uh, Jesus Christ, the person and work of Jesus Christ. So with the coming of Christ, uh, and the witness of his life, his death, his resurrection, uh, the message was actually not only being made evident by these the historical events that were happening, but it has now been even more made known to the world. So Paul is saying that, yes, all this was completed, done in the heart and mind of God, and at a, in the right time, the Kairos moment, uh, Jesus came, he fulfilled everything, he did everything, what was spoken to the prophets, what God instituted to the tabernacle, the prophets, sorry, the the uh, the, the priests, the sacrifices, uh, every, Jesus did everything. And now he's saying it is time for us to preach and teach about this and make it known to the world around us. So um, at Paul's time, you know, um, or, uh, or when Christianity came into the world, it was a time when uh, also was the right moment, the Kairos moment, because it was a time when it was uh, uniquely possible uh, to spread the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ very rapidly. And that's why we see the early church, the, the gospel was spread very rapidly and quickly uh, because there was one common language uh, that was Greek. And the Roman Empire was very, very vast. And, uh, you know, uh, you, I, 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 I hope you've heard the saying that says, you know, all roads lead to Rome. Uh, so travel was, uh, it was somewhere very easy. There was, uh, traveling was very easy for to travel. Like, you know, uh, uh, travel is very easy in Europe. When you go to Europe, you can just travel to various cities in, in very uh, less time. And also the world was very conscious of its need for a Messiah and a Savior. Okay, so William Barclay, the uh, commentary writer, uh, says there was never a time when the hearts of men were more open to receive the message of salvation with the Christian missionaries brought. So we see that Christianity came into a world when uh, it was um, the right time and it was uniquely possible for this message to be spread rapidly. And so Paul is saying that, you know, uh, yes. It was planned even, it, uh, salvation was planned even before um, uh, time began in eternity past. Christ fulfilled it. And Paul knew that preaching is the only way that God's eternal work or Paul's, uh, or God's work of salvation or redemption uh, could meet people uh, today. So preaching is the only way that God's word is made evident or made manifest. Okay, or made a reality, um, a very tangible reality, a presence uh, for people when God's word is preached. When what Christ has done on the cross is preached, it uh, makes it very evident for uh, people. Okay, and he says, Paul says, which was committed to me. Okay, so just reading that, but has in due time manifested this word through preaching, which was committed to me according to the commandment of God, our uh, Savior. So Paul viewed this message or the proclamation of the salvation message as a treasure which was entrusted to him. He says it was committed to him. So the Greek word committed means uh, to have faith, to entrust so the meaning here is to be entrusted with something, which is a privilege and a responsibility to proclaim this message. So Paul knew the work of preaching was entrusted to him. And it's not only entrusted to him only, but it is committed to all believers. Okay, uh, Because the Great Commission, Jesus told us to preach, teach, and baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay, so here in Titus, the apostle uh, becomes an example to Titus and to the believers at Crete or to the Cretans and to us that the message of the Savior is um, a, a treasure that we have received, okay, uh, for safekeeping 
And uh, even as it's a treasure that we have received for safekeeping, um, it's not something that we need to hide, like we, you know, keep all our jewelry and our very prized possessions uh, hidden and very carefully, you know, in lock and key. Um, so it's not something that should be hidden in a safe deposit box, but it's something that has to be proclaimed and shared with others. But why is he saying that it's a treasure that is kept given for safekeeping? Any idea? Why is Paul saying that's a message? Uh, this message of salvation is a message that has been deposited to us, is given to us as treasure for safekeeping. Any idea why he says that? Think of all that we have learned in the book of Romans, First Timothy, Second Timothy. Hello, class. I don't think it's a very difficult question. We've been talking about this over and over again. Why is the gospel message given to us as safekeeping? Come on, someone can try. What is basically Paul been talking about in First and Second Timothy? He's warning Timothy against whom? Okay, the false preachers. Yes, false preachers and false teachers. And he's saying, guard the doctrine that is deposited to you, it is given to uh, you. Okay, so we are supposed to, uh, uh, you know, it's a treasure, guard it and keep it for safekeeping. But it's not something to be hidden in a box, but something to be shared with others okay so this god is uh, you know given trust given us the, uh, to proclaim this message and it's not a take it or a leave it matter for christians it's not an option uh, for paul it's not an option for titus for timothy it's not an option for you and me you know and um, we have this great commission where we are uh, asked to be disciples and with a trust, a command given by the Savior to preach and teach and to baptize all believers. Okay, And then he says, God, our Savior. So Paul identifies God as our Savior. And this is some, uh, uh, a very, uh, um, uh, very uh, 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 title that's very close to our heart, that he's our God, he's our Savior. And it basically stresses the very nature and the heart of God that he's one who is concerned with man's salvation, uh, man's salvation, or he's concerned with, um, you know, the uh, sin's penalty, the power of sin, and uh, the presence of sin in our lives. And that is why he died and he set us free from the power, the dominion uh, and uh, of sin and uh, of death and Satan, okay? So that is what he's, when he's talking about eternal life, he's saying that it is, he's God our Savior, okay? Any questions before we move on to verse four? Any doubts? Um. Just a little more explanation on when you said uh, eternal life is uh, realizing uh, eschatology. You said uh, what yeah. the eschatology like? We realize it now. So how do we actually put it in practice? What is our view on it? Just a little more uh, explanation. Okay, eternal life is a uh, what? We say eternal life. What do we really mean? I always thought it's the life that's after, after heaven. Okay. Uh, so, but we also understand that we are going to live it eternally with God. But yeah, I'm quite confused. Okay, so when you talk about eternal life, what do we really mean? Even when, when you think it's a futuristic a hope. We believe there's no power of death over this. Mm -hmm. There's no more power over this. Uh, and we believe there's no pain. There's no tears. 
There's no specificness, there's no pain. Yes. So when Christ died on the cross, he broke the power of sin, power of death, and the power of Satan. And what does Paul write in Romans chapter 6? He says we are no longer, the power of sin over us is, you know, no longer operative. You know, it's rendered powerless, inoperative. Um, uh, we have the life and the nature of God. Okay, so we have, when we receive eternal life, we have the life and nature of God in our spirit man. Okay, yes, our flesh is still the same old flesh, our soul, our mind, our emotions is just the same. But we receive the life and the nature of God in our uh, spirit man. Okay, so for us to, which means that, you know, um, we can, uh, so it's not only when we go to heaven that we experience power over Satan, but also Paul writes in Romans chapter 6, our spiritual identification. How do we spiritually identify with Christ? Yes, we are, we, we spiritually identify with his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, and then seated at uh, sun. So when, what does it mean that when we are seated at the right hand of God? It basically means that we have authority over every dominion powers of Satan. So we already are there. Our spiritual identification is uh, that. So we operate from that. What do it mean that when Christ ascended, we also ascended? What does it mean? It means now we look at everything from heaven's perspective. So we already have the life and nature of God in us, which means that we have the power to say no to sin. We can overcome sin. We can overcome temptation. Um, uh, yes, we will have sickness and suffering, but you know, God has given us the weapons that we can, and the promises in His Word, the weapons that we use to fight against Satan, to to overcome uh, sickness, pain, uh, poverty. You know, and to walk in that um, the fullness of that eternal life. It's it's not something. It's yes, it's a futuristic hope. It's an eschatological hope. Eschatology means something way into the future. So it's uh, eternal life is an eschatological hope, but it's also realized eschatology. Something that we can realize now and live. We don't have to just go to heaven to and wait to overcome Satan. We can even we have already overcome Satan because Hebrews says that Jesus is the captain of our salvation. He has won the victory. We have already won the victory. We have dominion. He's given us everything that we need for life and godliness, all the weapons that we need. Uh, we can also walk in the power of the Holy Spirit like Jesus did. And that is why Jesus set us an example. He, he actually, when you look at Jesus' life, it's a taste of eternal life, what he did. But did he go through sufferings and hardships and difficulties? Yes. But did he enjoy the fullness of the God kind of life? Yes. Did he do the will of the Father? Did he overcome temptation? Yes. Did he do science, miracles, and wonders? Yes. Did he have joy, peace? Yes. So we can experience all of that here and now and not just wait till we go to heaven. Of course, that is in the perfect sense, uh, but this is also in a, in a very realized way that we can experience. We can experience God's move, his provision, his joy, his peace, even in the midst of turmoil and difficulties and pain, just like Jesus slept peacefully in the storm, you know, so also we can. So all of those things is something that we can still real uh, uh, experience. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Jeffina. That's a good question. Anyone else? Okay. If not, we will move on to verse 4, where uh, Paul is saying, he's, um, writing to, he's saying he's writing this to Titus, the true son in our common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so he's saying Titus, a true son, just basically uh, tight, uh, Paul had a, a relationship of, and looked at Titus as a son because he was somebody who mentored him and helped him to grow spiritually. Uh, and released him for the in, this, in the service of God, okay, and also says in our common faith that means Paul and Titus had a father-son relationship because of their common faith in the Lord Jesus 
Christ. Now, by using this term common, the apostle is reminding us that uh, which we hold in common with all uh, believers, that it's our faith in uh, Jesus, who is the Lord and Savior of our lives, who you know holds us together as a, uh, uh, as one in Christ. We are the body of Christ. We are one in uh, Him, regardless of the. Uh, the places we come from, the languages we speak, our race, whatever, you know, we are all one in Christ uh, uh, Jesus. Okay, so um, also that you know, um, in Christ Jesus, we uh, have brothers and sisters in Christ, and some cases we we have spiritual fathers and mothers, and uh, you know, it is this common faith that provides us the basis for harmony and communion. And then he goes on to say grace, uh, mercy, and peace. Uh, this is something that is we've already studied in First Timothy chapter 1. I explained this in detail in First Timothy chapter 1, uh, so I'm not going to look at it again. And then he says, from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. So, you know, uh, grace, mercy, and peace comes from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, our uh, Savior. Okay? explain all this in first Timothy chapter one so I'm not going to go through this again and then we'll move on to verses five to nine if anyone has any questions you can ask or doubts otherwise we'll move on to verses five to nine any questions any doubts okay then can somebody please read verses uh, five to nine of Titus chapter one please for this reason, I left you in Crete that you should set in order the things that were lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. If a man is blameless, a husband of one wife, having faithful children not accused of dispersion or insubordination, or insubordination, a bishop must be blameless as a steward of, war, of God, not self-willed, not quick tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but hospitable, a lover of what is good, sober minded, just, holy, self controlled, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exalt and convict those who contradict. Amen. Thank you, Lubega. So Paul is saying, for this reason, I left you in Crete. So Paul left Titus behind in Crete to basically stabilize the churches there um, and, uh, you know, look for qualified um, uh, people who could, you know, take over leadership positions. And this was specially needed in Crete uh, because, um, like I said in the introduction, the Cretans were, you know, uh, a wild bunch of people who were known uh, to be lazy and, uh, you know, liars. And uh, Titus uh, had this responsibility to find and train uh, good, uh, eligible, capable leaders um, for the churches in this island of Crete. So he's saying set in order. Uh, the Greek word for order basically means uh, to straighten further. Uh, to correct in addition. Um, that means when Paul and um, uh, Titus were in Crete, they did a certain amount of work um, at Crete, but now Titus has to continue on this work, and because the work has not finished, Paul felt the need to leave behind um, Titus there. Um, so Titus was to continue his work um, uh, and not leave the work behind and go away anywhere else, because if he does that, it will be like giving birth to children and not caring, you know, just caring uh, for them for a little while, and it will just basically look like abandoning them or leaving them at someone else's doorstep, okay? So Titus had to preach and teach to uh, teach them so that they can grow spiritually, um, and he can also appoint godly leaders and build those who were uh, childlike in their faith or babes in their uh, faith. Okay. Um, and he says, you know, um, uh, uh, set in order the things that are lacking. Okay. Now, if we compare the work of um, 
Timothy in um, Ephesus and Titus in Crete, it shows that there was much more lacking among the congregations of uh, the home churches at Crete because Paul specifically or specifically told Titus to set in order things that are lacking and we don't see any such command to uh, Timothy. Okay, And then he says, appoint uh, elders uh, in every city as I've commanded you. Um, and then he gives uh, the list of qualifications for the elders or the bishops. And I'm not going to, um, uh, you know, explain in detail verses 7, 8, and 9, because um, this is something that we've already looked at in First Timothy chapter 3, and I've already explained to you who is a bishop, who is who is an elder, and all of those things, and, you know, what it means to be self-controlled, hospitable, not violent, quick-tempered, self-will, not given to wine. I've explained all of that in detail. So I'll just mention here that he, in verse 6, he talks about domestic qualifications. He says, if a man is blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of dissipation or insubordination. And then in verse 7, he talks about personal qualifications. He says, for a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money. And then in verse 8, he talks about positive qualifications, but he must be hospitable, a lover of what is good, sober-minded, just, holy, self-controlled. Okay, And in verse 9, he talks about the doctrinal qualifications, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict. Okay, so. Um, he basically is talking about, you know, these are the qualifications that you have to look for in a, uh, in a, uh, in a uh, leader or elder or a bishop that you are appointing in the churches at Crete. So, um, Jeffina's question was, was Titus also as young as Timothy? Because Paul calls both of them and his sons just out of curiosity. Yes, um, I think both of them were um, uh, young. Um, I, I think when Paul left Timothy at Ephesus, you know, um, he was somewhere in his 30s. Uh, yes, so it is believed that uh, Titus also was uh, young, much like uh, Timothy, but their specific ages are not given in the biblical uh, text. But he, because he calls both of them as sons in the faith, it uh, basically, you know, talks about his closeness and also that they are very uh, young. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So in um, verse 9, he talks about the doctrinal um, qualifications, okay, um, of a leader. And then um, he also has mentioned positive qualifications and other qualifications that, uh, uh, that Titus needs to look for inner leader. Okay, so we'll move on to the characteristics of false teachers uh, in verses 10 to 16. So in verses 6 to 9, Paul basically lists, lists out um, what Titus must look for when he's appointing leaders, and Paul lists the qualifications, and we saw it can be divided into domestic, personal, positive, and doctrinal qualifications. And then he goes on to talk about the characteristics of false teachers in verses 10 to 16. So can one of you please read verses 10 to 16, please? For there are many insubordinate, both idol talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who, sub who subvert whole households, taking things they, which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. One of them, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in, in the faith, not giving heed of Jewish fables 
and commandments of men who turn from the truth. To the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but even their mind and conscience are defiled. They profess to know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. Amen. Thank you, Lubega. So in verse 10, he says, For there are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision. So he begins this, uh, uh, this part of the letter by saying, For. So in this section, he's introduced with uh, this word for, which gives the reason why elders with doctrinal qualifications are uh, needed, which Paul uh, mentions just before this, or he mentions or describes in verse 9 are needed. He's saying, look for people with doctrinal qualifications. Why? Because he says there are many who stand opposed to the truth. Uh, we read this in verse 9 and verse 14 as well. And he says these uh, people who oppose the truth are insubordinate, which means that someone who will not submit to God's authority. Okay. Um, and we know that God has established authority in various areas of our life, whether it is at the home, in the church, in the workplace, in the, in the community. And God wants us to recognize authority that he's placed in our lives and he wants us to submit to that authority. Okay. We'll stop here and we'll come back after the break and continue. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> 